So you guys have been asking for more audio examples, and today I want to demonstrate a couple of concepts for you. The biggest one is why do you need to work on speakers when you're mixing Dolby Atmos content? And the other one is going to be kind of why why you really want to stay on the wall with most of your panning decisions. They kind of run together. If you're new to the channel, my name is Dave Stagel. I'm a mix engineer based in Atlanta, Georgia. Mix in the studios, doing stereo and Atmos. I do live sound, consulting training, all kinds of stuff. I feel like a broken record with this. If you want to find out more about me, you can visit my website, stagelproductions.com. There's samples. There's ways to get in touch with me if you want to work with me, because I love working with other people. You can visit there. But let's jump in and talk about some Atmos stuff. One of the big debates with Atmos for Music right now is whether it is a speaker format or a headphone format. And as far as I'm concerned, it really is both. Right now, the largest listener base for Atmos content for music, it's probably headphones. I mean, maybe not even probably. It is headphones. I mean, we've got millions of people walking around with technology in their pocket to listen to Dolby Atmos content on their phone, and they're going to be doing it through headphones or earbuds or something like that. But I think it's a little short-sighted to consider Atmos only going to be for headphones forever for a couple of reasons. You know, the first is as the technology for speakers becomes more affordable and the price goes down, we might see a rise in people actually listening on speakers. I mean, anytime I play Atmos content for musicians, clients, family, friends, whoever I can get into my studio to hear it, Everybody is sold on it. Everybody loves it. You can't experience it quite the same through headphones. Maybe one day the technology will be there, but right now it's not quite there. So I think when people start getting exposed to it and hearing it, there is a desire to have an opportunity to listen to it on speakers on a more regular basis. And when you consider all of the film and television content that's out there these days in Atmos, for someone to have a speaker set up, it's actually kind of a nice thing to have. Music is not the only game when it comes to Atmos by any stretch. Atmos has been around for 10 years, as I've mentioned before. It's just kind of a newer thing for music. The other big thing for Atmos for music with speakers that everybody forgets is cars. Automobile manufacturers are starting to put Atmos technology into their cars. And as that becomes more widespread, people are going to be listening to it more on speakers. And some people may not want to get out of their cars when they start hearing it in there versus on earbuds. But that's a whole other story. So I guess my point is, Yes, headphones matter, speakers matter as well. And if you are trying to get into mixing Atmos and you just, you're not ready to commit to the investment, and it is an investment to set up speakers, and you're thinking, well, I can just do this on headphones. And there's sort of some truth to that. I think headphones is a great way to start learning how the tech side of things works. It's a great way to start mixes and experiment and play around. But if you are going to be releasing Atmos content, you have to have your mixes checked on speakers. That doesn't mean you have to do it. There are other ways, and I'll talk about that at the end of the video. But your mixes, they need to get checked on speakers. They might need to get finished on speakers. And today, I want to demonstrate, hopefully, why that is the case. So let's hop over to Pro Tools and let's look at some examples. So I have some pink noise here. We're going to start with pink noise. And I have it set to two different objects and they're both panned a little bit different. So the first one is on the wall and you can see that right there in the corner. And then for the second object, I'm just kind of pulling it off. So you can see there's that one here. If I open them both, 
So you can see here's one object here, that 37, and then there's the other one that's off the wall. It's up in the air a little bit. Let's listen to those. For this, we're going to use headphones to start. So let's check it in the binaural. So grab your favorite pair of headphones, and here we go. So here is the first bit of noise. This is just this first object. Pink noise. Sounds like pink noise. Here's the next one that's pulled off the wall and uh, it's kind of floating a little bit. So again, they just, they sound like pink noise. There's not much difference. I mean, tonally, there's a little bit of difference listening in headphones because of the way the binaural renderer is working to kind of give us the impression of where that object is in space it's going to change the frequency shading and some things a little different. And you can kind of see that here. I'll just show you. If you watch on the levels a minute, if we've just got the one right there, 37, we can see that's only going to the right speaker. When I open it up into that other object, you can see how the renderer routes things a lot different and starts putting that sound into multiple basically speaker channels. Uh, for the binaural though, there is no multiple speaker channels. All we've got is the left and the right and the binaural just simulates it. But for speakers, the way that Dolby Atmos works, the renderer, it's just like, it's like a level-based panning basically. So as we move something around in space, it's going to distribute that signal to different speaker channels, depending on how many channels you have. And that's the beauty of Atmos is we can have anything from, you know, 714 is what we're supposed to mix on, but you could take it down to 512, 5171 stereo. I mean, it, it's not dependent on a particular speaker configuration to listen back. Binaural, though, has to be on headphones because we're doing some emulation there. But point is, sounds like pink noise, not much of a difference either way. Now, I know it's pink noise, pink noise is not realistic. It's not really, it's, it's just a test signal. So let's, let's just try it with a guitar. So I've got a guitar here. I've got the same guitar track and I've got it going to objects in those same positions as the pink noise. So let's go back to our headphones. Here is that first one, which is up against the wall. All right, now here is the object that's pulled off the wall. So again, it just, it sounds like a guitar. We're not really hearing much of a difference. I mean, there is a little bit of a tonal shift, again, because of the way the binaural is working to give our brains the perception that it is in a different spot. And, you know, it's not quite the same. But just listening to them individually just sounds like a guitar. So let's look at what happens when we actually put these different pan positions up onto speakers. Okay, so what I've got now is I've got my measurement mic, one of the mics I use for calibrating systems, tuning PAs, that kind of stuff. I've got that set up in my listening position so that we can hear what do those same sounds, what do they do when they're coming out of the speakers and we have them in these different panning positions. And I'm gonna do a couple of things here. I'm gonna kind of move the mic around a little bit to sort of just simulate what happens when we move our head a little bit. And then I'm gonna move the microphone a little bit more so that you can hear, well, what would happen if you weren't sitting quite in the sweet spot? Which for Atmos, when you start getting into bigger speaker systems, bigger listening rooms, things like that, maybe you're in a control room and you've got your client there and you know they're not quite sitting in the sweet spot, or maybe there's a couple of band members who are kind of spread around it. What happens when we listen back on that? So let's do the same sounds through this microphone. We'll start with 
pink noise. So here is the first one. This is the pink noise on the wall. So you should be hearing a little bit of comb filtering. Some of that's gonna happen as we move the mic because the sound from that speaker, it's also reflecting off of my control surface, other surfaces in the rooms. My room is not completely dead. I don't like studios that are absolutely completely dead. So we're gonna hear some of the reflection off of that into that microphone. In the room itself, our brains kind of don't, we don't notice that as much. But now let's go to that pink noise that is off the wall. So right away, this is Comb Filter City. We're hearing all kinds of strange interactions from the different time arrivals because now that pink noise is coming out of multiple speakers in here. And every time I move this microphone, I am changing the timing relationship between it and those speakers. Even just me right here when I turn that on, it sounds wacky in here. But what about a guitar? Let's, let's go and do the guitar examples. So here is that first guitar that is panned really on the wall and is really just gonna be coming out of a single speaker. Now, here is that other guitar that is off the wall a bit, and I'm gonna move the mic around. So, yeah. So with that guitar, when I just have it in the single speaker, when it's panned on the wall, it sounds like a guitar. When I pull it off the wall though, in the room, it sounds wacky. It's just, it's like having two speakers where one of them is wired out of polarity. I mean, it's just a lot of phase weirdness. And as I move my head, it's just, weird. I don't feel like the measurement mic really picks this up quite the same as the way it is here in the room, but you can hear on the measurement mic, you can hear it shifting tonally as that microphone moves. Now, from a real world perspective, if you think about this from a practical sense, let's say, let's say I'm working with a band and I've, you know, I'm in a bigger Atmos studio because mine doesn't have a lot of room for lots of people in it. But let's say, you know, I went over to a friend's studio. I'm playing back a mix for somebody. I've got a lead singer there and his guitar player is right next to him. Lead singer's in the sweet spot, guitar player's a little bit off. When I play that mix for them, that guitar player, he might lose his mind. And every little shift of his head, his tone is gonna change because you know, he's gonna be focusing on his guitar. I don't wanna do that. I don't wanna have to answer the questions. I don't want an artist saying to me, what the heck did you do to my guitar? Or voice, or keyboards, or drums, or any of those kinds of things. So it's real important to me to work in Atmos on speakers. Let's talk about what's happening. Why, why do we hear all that weirdness? And it's just, it's phase, basically. When I pull that object off the wall, as I showed you in the renderer, now that sound is getting put into multiple speakers. Well, 
wherever I am in the room or wherever you are in the room, there is a time relationship between you and each of those speakers. Every time you move, you are changing that time relationship. And phase, contrary to what I find a lot of engineers think, phase is not the button on the console that you flip. That is a polarity flip. Phase is a function of time. And when we are working in, you know, in the atmosphere here on Earth, the speed of sound is not instant. And with every different frequency we have, those frequencies have different wavelengths. Well, distance is time. So if our low frequencies have longer wavelengths, it's going to take a longer amount of time for those to cycle than it is for higher frequencies. And as we move our head around, we are changing the way that frequencies interact. We're changing the way that things combine in our ears and we get that weird phase thing going on. It's not typically something we worry about in the studio because, you know, for for as long as most of us can remember, we've only really been working with two speakers. And this same phenomenon, it has been happening for us for as long as we've been working in stereo. It's just not as noticeable when it's only between two speakers. And it's also something that we're kind of used to, but it's been going on. Now, when I pull that object off the wall, I'm not just putting it in two speakers. I've got it going into the right front and the right side, and it goes into the height, and it even starts coming into the left a little bit. It, it's ending up in a lot of different places. And this is part of what I mentioned in another one of my panning videos, and that Atmos does not emulate presence. You can't bring something more towards the center of the room and have it feel like it's closer. That's not the way it works. The technology doesn't do that yet. I don't know that Atmos ever will, but I'm sure one day we will have the ability to do that. It's not there yet. So what we get is when we pull it more into the center of the room or we start moving it around, all we're doing is we're just gonna put it in more speakers. And the number of speakers it plays back in this is a moving target. It's going to depend largely on the playback system of whoever's listening. You know, it might be somebody listening in, you know, 512 setup, 714, 916, maybe a giant movie theater. I mean, who knows? But there's always going to be that different time relationship there. And when we have something coming into multiple speakers like that, like when we pull it off the wall, that's where we can get into a lot of wackiness. And that's just one of those things. It's it's a gotcha. If you're only working on headphones, you are not going to hear it. It's going to just sound like what you think it should sound like. So this is one of those reasons why, to me, it's really important if you are working on Atmos, at some point, you have to listen to it on speakers or somebody has to listen to it on speakers because you're not going to get these gotchas if you don't check it that way. There are also gotchas going from speakers to headphones, which is why I have a set of headphones in here and I check mixes on headphones that I've worked on the speakers with. But the point is, I think you have to do both. You have to check on speakers, you have to check on headphones. That's just part of the workflow these days. And it is easier, I think, in my opinion, to get figured out what do I do on speakers and have that translate down to headphones than to go the other way. So what do you do if you're only working on headphones for Atmos right now and you want to release some content, you want to make sure that it's going to be okay? Well, it's really simple. Just partner with another engineer who actually mixes on speakers like me. I love working with other engineers and I love helping people out with this stuff. And I'm not alone. There are other Atmos engineers out there who I'm sure would help you, but just reach out and say, hey, I'm working in Atmos. Can I hire you to check a mix? Can you listen to something? Can you give me feedback? Can you finish it and master it? 
That's why we have mastering engineers for stereo. It's the same thing for Atmos. So don't panic if you're working on headphones or you're not ready to get into a full setup. There are ways that you can have your music and have your client's music released in Atmos. Yeah, it's going to cost a little bit more, but it's not going to be, well, it shouldn't be crazy. At least not if you're working with me, I don't think. So anyways, if you want help with an Atmos mix, please drop me a line. www.stagelproductions.com is the website. You can reach me there. Anyways, I hope this has been informative, has kind of explained some things, demonstrated some things, given you ideas. Uh, if you've got questions or comments about Atmos or really anything mixing, go ahead, leave a comment, let me know, and I will talk to you later. <laughs>